So I think we'll get started. Um, we've got lots of people on online today. I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, for coming and welcome. Um, also, would like to welcome the audience uh, participating through our live webcasting. Uh, please also note that the presentation is being videotaped, and if you want to access it uh, past this presentation, just easily go to our uh, Covey website and uh, take a look. Um, I'd like to introduce this week's speaker. <laughs> it's looking very dapper. Um, Ralph Brown uh, comes to us from the College of Physical and Engineering Science from the University of Guelph. Ralph is a biological engineer and an agronomist. <laughs> As a professor and graduate coordinator at the School of Engineering, University of Guelph, he also teaches bioinstrumentation design, systems modeling, and simulation. Ralph has amassed more than 20 years of research work in precision agriculture, uh, which of course is the airborne, airborne hi, uh, remote sensing for weed detection and precision culp crop spraying. Sorry. In 2002, he shifted his attention to precision viticulture after a sabbatical in Australia. I, I am surprised you came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need to make a living. <laughs> uh, Ralph also continues to work with Andy Reynolds here at Covey on geospatial technologies and instrumentation to implement precision viticulture in Niagara. And welcome and thank you, Ralph. Thanks, Bert. Okay, we're good to go. Um, the working title for my presentation today is, as you see, Unlocking Unseen Mysteries of the Vineyard. And uh, the reason that that is the working title is because when I actually sent my title to Barb, she said, that doesn't sound very interesting. You have to come up with something more exciting. So we went back and forth on a few ideas, and eventually we settled on this one. Um, and I think it's got a nice sort of a cache. It's got a mix of sort of CSI and the X-Files. And uh, <clears throat> we know that they're pretty popular. So uh, I think that, that maybe is a good thing. And I think it also fits nicely into this slide that I use for my background, because that was uh, actually uh, David Lamb, one of my colleagues at, uh, in Australia. He was at Charles Sturt University at that time. <clears throat> and we're in our disposable overalls out there in the middle of a vineyard taking some measurements. And we had to get all suited up because we were in a phylloxera uh, infestation area in Victoria. And uh, of course, we had to prevent any spread of the, uh, the infestation. So we had to uh, show up looking like these CSI operatives. And uh, so there is some kind of a thread of logic in here, but uh, I'm not sure that's a good one. Anyway, what I want to talk about today has to do with instrumentation related to precision viticulture. And uh, essentially we all know that it's important to go out and scout in the vineyards and, and look at the, at, the, uh, at the vines, look at the leaves, look at the fruit. Uh, and of course everybody does it. Uh, and this is important because you have to get feedback in terms of what's happening in terms of disease, nutrition, water stress, and so forth. The only problem is when we do these sorts of activities, we're limited to our own senses. We use our eyeballs, obviously, um, which means that we look in the visible part of the spectrum. We also use our hands and we use our nose and our mouth in some cases. But these visible, uh, sort of the spectral information, we're limited to the visible spectrum when we're using our own eyes. But of course, if we get into the field of instrumental spectroscopy, then that allows us to look in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, uh, we can look in the ultraviolet, the uh, short wavelengths. Uh, I understand that bumblebees apparently can see in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and their world looks quite different than it does to us, because we can't. Uh, certainly in the visible part of the spectrum, and then when we get into the longer wave, the near-infrared and the infrared, these parts of the electromagnetic spectrum may also contain information that is useful and important. And of course, we, we have to use an instrumentation to investigate that. So this little picture here is a picture of me at work in, uh, actually in uh, New South Wales, I guess, taking some leaf reflectance measurements uh, with a so-called portable spectrometer in the vineyard. Well, we know, of course, from scouting that uh, good fruit quality starts with a healthy, well-balanced vine. 
Um, we also know that the linkage is not particularly direct. Obviously, uh, good, healthy vines produce uh, reasonable quality fruit, um, but there's more to it than that. We also know that plant stress will typically show up in the foliage. So if we have things like problems with the photosynthetic apparatus, then we tend to start to see some chlorosis and uh, different things happening. Uh, other plant pigments are affected as well as chlorophyll, and often this is evident in the foliage. And when we look at uh, the different sort of plant pigments that are involved, then we also know that these absorb and reflect in different parts of the spectrum. And this therefore leads to changes in uh, the leaf reflectance characteristic. And what I'm showing here on the left-hand side, this is a, uh, the instrument that I showed you earlier when I was in the vineyard. This is called an ASD field spec, a portable spectrometer. Uh, basically, this is the business end of it here. Uh, they call it a potato masher. It's essentially a light source and a uh, reflectance uh, instrument. It picks up the reflected illumination from the leaf. Here's a grape leaf down here. And it takes the uh, reflected illumination and feeds it back to the uh, spectrometer, which is actually in this backpack here through a uh, fiber optic cable. And then, of course, we have to control the thing, and we control it with a laptop computer. So the idea behind this, uh, at least behind a foliage part of the talk, and I have to apologize, this slide, uh, I originally created it in uh, PowerPoint 2007, and this version apparently doesn't like it. It was supposed to look like an actual spectrum where you had red through to blue on the far side, but it somehow got flipped over and perverted a little bit in terms of its colors. But anyway, this is the idea. The visible part of the spectrum that I've indicated here which ranges from about, oh, about 400 nanometers through to uh, 680 or 700 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Um, this is the part of the spectrum that we see in. If we go to the longer wavelengths, the infrared and the, uh, well, the near infrared first down here at the edge and then farther into the infrared, we're getting to, into longer wave, less energetic type of radiation. Down at the other end of the spectrum, going towards shorter wavelengths, we get into the ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays and high energy types of radiation. When we look at the pigments that are involved with uh, photosynthesis, the apparatus of uh, leaves, then of course we know that chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B absorb in the blue part of the spectrum and also in the red part of the spectrum, but they reflect green uh, radiation. And that's why, of course, active photosynthesizing synthesizing leaves look green to us because they reflect green. Um, other pigments that are involved, xanthophils and carotenoids, they typically absorb part of the blue spectrum as well, and they reflect through uh, green to red part of the spectrum. So uh, if nothing else was present, then they would give sort of a yellow-orange color to the leaf. Anthocyanins, another class of pigments, uh, they typically absorb in the green part of the spectrum, and they reflect in the blue and the red. Consequently, uh, to us, the anthocyanin compounds, uh, when they're present, give us purple and uh, reddish colors. Well, many people over many years have investigated this whole concept of instrumentally trying to determine what's happening as far as plant stress is concerned. And I've got just a few studies here that I'm going to refer to. Uh, the first one uh, done by Carter back in the uh, early 90s, they essentially looked at a lot of broadleaf uh, leaves and a lot of different types of environmental stresses, uh, which included ozone, uh, well, elevated ozone levels, powdery mildew, uh, extreme temperatures, um, some herbicide damage. And they basically came up with the realization that most of this environmental stress caused changes in the leaf reflection in the 535 to 640 nanometer range, or from sort of the beginning of the green up into the red. Uh, an area around the far end of the red spectrum, 670 nanometers, was generally unresponsive. In other words, as different stresses occurred, you didn't see much change in the reflectance in that area. Um, another study that was done in uh, the late uh, 1990s by Lee Johnson in California was looking at phylloxera infestation. That's obviously a, a big problem in some parts of the world where there are still original rooted vines, uh, not so much around here because we don't do that. But what 
Johnson found from remote sensing was that uh, when you had an infestation of the phylloxera rootlose, you tended to get an increase in the green reflectance of the leaves. So that, uh, that was a clue, perhaps, to an infestation occurring. Of course, other things would cause a response in the green part of the spectrum as well. A, uh, a later study here, uh, one done in 2009, looking at anthocyanin biosynthesis in leaves, and this often will occur as a result uh, of drought stress or extreme temperatures, extreme light uh, in some cases. And in that situation, that caused a reduction in the green reflectance. So here we have a situation where uh, some stresses will cause an increased green response, others will cause uh, a decreased green. Regardless what, of what happens in the uh, visible part of the spectrum, though, what we find is that if we look into the near-infrared, the longer wavelengths, starting at about 720, 730 nanometers and going up, for most leaves, it's pretty constant. It doesn't change very much except under extreme water stress. And when I say extreme water stress, that's like when you have wilting uh, and, and real, a real problem with moisture, which affects the actual structure of the leaf. So taking this realization that the reflected light energy that's coming back from a leaf will tell us something about the status of the leaf, in the area of remote sensing, which is one area that I've worked in for a number of years, a typical vegetation index that is used is one that uses the infrared part of the spectrum and the red part of the spectrum. So this, which is called a normalized difference vegetation index, it essentially uses the near-infrared, this rho sub NIR, that basically stands for the reflectance in the near-infrared part, and this is typically around 740 to 760 nanometers, and it doesn't change very much. So the normalization occurs because we use that in both uh, parts of the fraction here, and then the actual part that's going to change is the red reflectance, the rho red. And when we combine this, then we come up with an index, which will range between minus 1 and plus 1. And it will give us an indication of the photosynthetically active biomass that is in the image that is being remotely sensed. Well, in this particular study, I'm not so much interested in remote sensing as I am in proximal sensing, sensing where I actually have instrumentation. I'm going right up either next to the vine or physically touching the leaves. So in this case, I've looked at a slightly different index, which, which I've uh, adopted to use, and I call this the normalized green-red reflectance, or NGRR. And essentially what this does is it takes that green peak, the 550 nanometer, and it also takes that red trough at 670, which we saw earlier doesn't change very much, and we use the difference between those to detect uh, plant stress. And then we normalize it again using the near infrared in a way that the NDVI does. So a similar type of approach. So again, I get an index that's normalized. Well, when I was on sabbatical in Australia, one of the things that we looked at was this problem of phylloxera spread. And parts of Australia, I think even now, still have uh, what they call phylloxera-free zones. And we did some work in Victoria where it was known that there was phylloxera moving into the area. And uh, we visited a couple of vineyards uh, where they had Cab Sauv and Cab Franc uh, uh, blocks. And there was also this sort of moving in of the phylloxera root lows. What we did was we went into these blocks and we took 50 fully expanded intact leaves, more or less at random within each of these blocks. And then, in order to verify that we actually had clean or infested vines, we had uh, a couple of people that were with us there, and they actually dug up the vines and pulled out the roots and looked at them. And then they verified that, yes, these were infested or not. So that we knew that uh, the leaves came from a particular category. We measured the leaf reflectance, again, using this ASD field spec that I mentioned a minute ago. And then we compared the leaf reflectance characteristic and I've interpreted this in terms of the uh, normalized green-red reflectance for the infested and the clean blocks. So this is sort of the raw data that we would see. Uh, these uh, basically are the complete scans. These are the mean of 50 leaves for each of the healthy vine category or the phylloxera infested category in red. 
And you can see pretty visually what's happening here. When we get the infestation down here in the green to red part of the spectrum, there's quite a marked deviation between the red curve and the blue curve. So we're seeing a definite response there. We're seeing, because the red is the infested vine, we're seeing an increase in the green peak here, and we're seeing corresponding increase in reflectance over the yellow, orange, red part of the spectrum as well. A little bit of a change up here in the infrared plateau, not very much, but in this case, it's reversed. Here we have the healthy vines have slightly higher reflectance than the infested vines. And I think that partly reflects the water status because the infestation, of course, interferes with normal water and nutrient uptake. And uh, it's possible that we were seeing uh, an effect in the moisture content of the leaves as well. Anyway, taking that data and converting it into this normalized green-red reflectance, as I've done here, where the little circles indicate a healthy block or healthy leaves, and the little X's indicate a uh, leaf taken from an infested vine, we can do a fairly straightforward uh, segregation of these, and I just sort of semi-arbitrarily drew a line through here at 0.7 in terms of this NGRR, and it partitions the data pretty well. Most of the healthy vines have a reflectance uh, index above that, so most of the circles are above that line. Most of the infested are below. We do get some false positives showing up here and some false negatives showing up down here as well. But by and large, we're getting a reasonably good uh, detection in terms of what our leaf reflectance is telling us. Well, that might be of some interest to people in California or people in, in uh, Australia, but in Niagara, it's not such a big uh, interesting area because uh, we don't use original rooted vines. So what we wanted to do was take some of that information and look at what else we might be able to learn by looking at the uh, spectroscopic response of the uh, foliage in, in Niagara Vineyards. So we sort of piggybacked on an ongoing project that we've got going with the 30 bench winemakers at uh, their Riesling Vineyard, which is just on the west side of Beamsville. And what we wanted to do was investigate the single leaf reflectance characteristics of what we call our sentinel vines in situ. In other words, they're still on the vine. We don't rip them off and take them back to the lab. And at the same time, what we want to do is monitor the performance of the vines over the growing season and into harvest when we're going to look at the fruit characteristics. So the idea was that we would go in and we would measure the leaf reflectance of these fully expanded leaves, and we did five leaves per sentinel vine. And we did this approximately monthly over the growing season, and we did it for approximately 500 sentinel vines in this vineyard. At the same time, because we had this larger precision viticulture project going on, and this was with Andy Reynolds uh, here at Covey, and uh, a few other people were involved, and uh, a number of graduate students, actually a large number, we went out and we also determined, while we were taking our measurements, soil moisture, vine water status, uh, harvest yield data, uh, harvest yield quality, uh, and also we looked at some wine characteristics as well. So here's the little apparatus that uh, we set up and we used. Uh, this is David Lederhoff. He's actually uh, just finishing up his master's here at Covey right now. Uh, one summer he did some work for me where he ran around and he took these leaf reflectance measurements. What we have here is a fairly, fairly inelegant, unsophisticated uh, apparatus. Basically, it's a pair of uh, barbecue tongs from Canadian Tire. And uh, they're modified substantially, of course, uh, because what I also have up here is a quartz halogen light source and a hemispherical chamber, which essentially pinches a leaf. And beneath it, we have a non-reflective uh, background. And here's the fiber optic cable coming out from it. And so essentially what this is doing is illuminating a leaf and also measuring its reflectance. And uh, the other fellow here in the blue shirt is Albert Brooks. He, uh, he's now, uh, well, he finished up a master's with me at Guelph, and he's uh, doing some work with Lakeview Vineyard Equipment. He's the cigarette girl uh, approach here. Basically what he has is a backpack which has the spectrometer on it. Now we call this portable. It's loosely portable. 
Anyway, he's got the spectrometer in the backpack. He's got this tray which has the laptop on it, which is controlling the spectrometer. And then he's also lugging around this battery pack down here, which supplies the energy to light the light and power the spectrometer in the laptop. So they can go through the vineyard, and what they're doing here is selecting leaves and taking the uh, measurements of reflectance. And what they're doing is taking fully expanded leaves on the uh, fruiting canes and, and looking at that reflectance. Well, in terms of data representation, what I've presented here are a few plots where I've taken, uh, in this case, the top two maps are created based on this normalized green-red reflectance value. Uh, the top one was done on July 26th. The middle one was done on the 24th of August. Now, if you were from around here and you were in the area in 2007, of course, you know that 2007 was an extremely dry year also one of the best vintages we've had in quite a while. But anyway, uh, if we look at the soil moisture down here at the bottom, this gives you another data layer, which is the uh, uh, TDR moisture that we determined in that vineyard. And the reason that I present these together is to show you visually that there seems to be a connection between the soil moisture, which obviously is going to interact with the plant uh, status, if it's very dry, as it was in this year, it can cause moisture stress. And the resulting uh, leaf characteristics in terms of this normalized green-red reflectance. So the closest two to compare, obviously, are the, uh, this is in August the 24th, so this is post verizon And if we look at this, we can see, uh, if you use your imagination, some zones, for example, there's a zone down here which has a lot of red. This corresponds to a low NGRR. And we see that it also corresponds down here on the soil moisture map with a zone which has low, low soil moisture. In case you can't read this scale down here, this is 6, 8, 10% uh, moisture, so it's pretty dry. We have another zone here where we have low reflectance, and we have this zone in here which also has low soil moisture. And then in between, we have this sort of diagonal region where we have, well, it's still pretty dry, but relatively it's moist compared to the rest of the vineyard. And we see that we have also an increase in this NGRR. So the foliage is responding. And of course, if we look back earlier in the year, in July, when there was still a fair bit more moisture in, the, in this vineyard, which, by the way, was not irrigated, uh, then we can see that the pattern is still there, but not nearly as, as uh, noticeable as it is later on in the season. So the human eye is pretty good at picking up patterns, well combined with your brain, of course. And you can sort of see that there are some patterns here of uh, sort of convergence between the two. And the idea then is that this vegetation index is giving some information about the underlying soil moisture, which you would expect. Here's another pair of plots, another way of looking at in this particular case, again, this is the leaf reflectance, the NGRR on August the 24th. And this is the sugar, the uh, degrees bricks at harvest for those vines. Now, obviously, the relationships aren't as tight here. We're getting a lot, uh, a lot more um, complexity now between the transformation that goes from the uh, leaf characteristics to the fruit. But in general, we see the same sort of patterns. We see an area up here where uh, we have a low return in terms of the normalized green-red re reflectance. And we also see a low bricks situation here. In the middle, where we see somewhat higher return, we see, well, except for this little island, we see that we have somewhat higher bricks in there as well. Down here in the drier part of the vineyard, then we start to see the uh, bricks dropping off also. Well, what does that tell us? Well, I have to say, scientifically, it doesn't tell us an awful lot because the correlations that we actually get between some of these uh, indirect measurements that we're taking of reflectance and the actual fruit quality parameters at harvest are just not there. There is some relationship, obviously, between plant stress, leaf reflectance, and subsequent fruit quality. But it's not so tight that we can use one to predict the other with any kind of accuracy. So obviously, these correlations are not reliable enough for easy prediction. 
However, they do point to something that's happening in the vineyard. And other factors obviously affect the fruit quality as well, crop load, the weather, uh, pruning, trellising, all of these things affect uh, perhaps more than what we're seeing here. But the leaf reflectance may have potential to map variations in the vineyard. So it may not be useful in an absolute term to predict, but it may be useful in order to map out those zones that are different. And then we have to find out why. But of course, you don't just have Dave and Albert at your disposal with their uh, handheld spectrometer to run around and do all of these measurements. So we have to look to better and automated ways of doing that. And fortunately, in the last few years, a few of these have come on the market. This piece of apparatus that I'm showing here is Entex Green Seeker. And basically what it is, it's a two-band spectrometer. This is the business end of it right here. It's a little window. It looks over at the, uh, well, whatever is in the field of view. In this case, it's looking down at the uh, vegetation on, uh, along the uh, trellis wire here. And the idea is that it will measure the red and the near-infrared reflectance automatically. And it's mounted on an ATV, a uh, little four-wheeler here. So you can drive along. And this particular ATV also has a GPS. There's an antenna down here, and you've got your GPS. And a co control computer works with the uh, Green Seeker and with the GPS so that you can just drive along, and you can automatically take measurements as you go. And here's a picture of uh, a, little, a little more developed canop canopy, obviously. Uh, but the same system, this is the Green Seeker on a, on a, a little four-wheeler. And uh, this happy fellow is running up and down, taking uh, measurements as he goes. And in this particular case, whoops. What's happening is the red and the near-infrared reflectance are being converted into the normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI. So what we see over here is a map, the kind of map that would be created. If you were to look closely at that, you would see that it's actually a whole bunch of little dots of different colors strung together. But the idea is, as this green seeker goes through the vineyard, it takes snapshots. Uh, they aren't actually images, they're actually just readings. And it keeps track of where they are, and then it maps them. This uh, particular slide uh, is taken from a study. Uh, it was done at the Mission Estate Vineyard in uh, New Zealand. Kane Thompson sent this to me. Uh, basically, they run a, uh, a company called Spatial Solutions, and they'll do some of this NDVI mapping. And in fact, this map here on the left side, this is a Merlot block, and then we have a Syrah block on the right-hand side. And this is essentially an NDVI map based on this Green Seeker technology. And in this case, the color scheme is different than what I've been using. In this case, the, uh, the blue is a high NDVI uh, indicated here, and the green is a lower. But the idea is that there are two fairly distinct zones in this vineyard. Most of the blue is down here at the bottom, and it tends to be lighter at the top. So what they've done in this particular vineyard is they've segregated the fruit and they've harvested this lower section, kept it separate, harvested the upper section, kept it separate, and made two different wine batches. One which uh, was able to produce a premium quality and the other one which produced essentially a table wine. So the intent there was we can do this vineyard canopy mapping semi-automated uh, we can use that information to perhaps decide which zones we might want to manage differently, and we can benefit from it in one way or another. Certainly, if we can produce a, uh, a more premium quality wine from a vineyard that we would normally not be able to obtain, then that's uh, perhaps one reason to do it. So is there potential for using some of this vineyard canopy reflectance in precision viticulture? Well, the hardware's there already. You, the Green Seeker, uh, Entex Green Seeker is out there. There's also the Crop Circle system, and undoubtedly there are other systems as well. And these are commercially available systems, and they will go in and they will create vegetation maps in the vineyard in a relatively easy fashion. And that is combined with evidence that the variation in, in NDVI, which is related to photosynthetically active biomass, is actually related to harvest quantity and quality. So there is some sort of a connection there. 
even though it's not as direct as we would hope that it would be. This sort of proximal remote sensing using the uh, sort of automated green seeker approach may be more convenient than remote sensing. Traditionally, what we have done is we've used either airborne or satellite-borne remote sensing uh, imaging systems to look at, uh, look at the vineyard uh, from above and basically in a snapshot fashion determine uh, the reflectance. But that's not the only way that it can be done, and obviously this approach is an alternative, and it might be more convenient. You don't have to schedule a flight. You don't have to organize a uh, satellite imagery. Um, you don't have to wait for even a particularly nice day. If you've got a four-wheeler and the hardware, you can go out and do it. Obviously, though, even though there's some potential, the linkages between the complexity of vine balance and health and fruit quality are very complicated. And we need more research. We, we really don't know or we can't translate very well what we see in the foliage and what it's telling us versus what that's going to ultimately transpire when we harvest the fruit. But we're making progress. The other uh, part that I want to talk about of this sort of instrumentation applied to spectral reflectance of the grape crop is to leave the leaves and look at the grapes, look at the fruit. So we're looking at, at least I'm looking at it, my group is looking at the reflectance of grape fruit uh, in the visible and near-infrared part of the spectrum to give us information about its ripeness and its quality. Now, just like with the leaves, the same situation is true for the fruit, that when you have the interaction of matter with electromagnetic radiation, with light, then different chemicals are going to absorb and reflect different parts of the spectrum based upon uh, the bonds, the, uh, the bond energies that are involved. It's quite a complicated physical situation, but it's fairly straightforward. We know that different chemicals, different pigments absorb and reflect in different parts of the spectrum. Consequently, if we look at the reflectance pattern, that will reveal some aspects of the chemical composition. Now, of course, you don't need some kind of a scientist to tell you that. You know yourself that what happens to grapes, particularly red grapes, when they get ripe? Well, they turn from green to red to dark. The color changes, the sugar content goes up, the acidity changes. Uh, we see more anthocyanins and phenolics. But some of these things you can see with your own eyes. But not all of them. What we are interested in doing is trying to get indirect estimates of fruit quality by looking at the absorbance and reflectance characteristics of fruit in different parts of the spectrum. And most of the research has revolved around looking at some of the standard sort of quality parameters that we're interested in as harvest approaches. Total solids or sugar uh, degrees bricks, uh, titratable acidity, pH, in the case of red grapes, phenolic and anthocyanin com content as well. And we want to get this in a very indirect, uh, straightforward manner where we don't have to go into the lab and do chemical analysis. We can do it instrumentally. Some of you might be familiar already with some work that was done in this regard by uh, Dr. Robert Wampel uh, at Fresno. And uh, you may have heard of an instrument called the Brimrose, um, variously called Le Vigneron, or also called the Luminar 5030. But basically, this is some uh, work that was done, oh, it must be about 10 years ago now, I guess, looking at a portable handheld instrument that uses the near-infrared part of the spectrum. And what it does is it scans one grape berry at a time. Um, it's, in this particular case, the instrument that's used is what's called uh, an acousto-optic uh, tunable filter. Uh, just a fancy way of saying that uh, it scans one wavelength at a time and the wavelength changes uh, through this acousto-optic optic coupling uh, of the filter. What it does though, it requires direct contact with the berry. And it only measures the reflectance of one berry at a time. So you can imagine if you want to know this current state of the fruit in your vineyard, or maybe just in one row of your vineyard, 
you're going to have to sample a heck of a lot of berries to get a representative value. So many, many berries have to be sampled. It is loosely called portable, so it can be used in the vineyard, or you can take fruit to it if you want, which is the way we actually did it. At the moment, it tends to be relatively expensive in the, uh, I guess, twelve to $15,000 range probably, relatively time consuming, but it's faster than doing chemical, chemical analysis on all of the grapes every time. One problem that we found is that the season to season prediction has not been particularly robust. So that means that we usually need to do recalibration uh, in each growing season, at least in Ontario. This is the business end of the Brimrose NIR spectrometer, and this is what I mean where we have a cluster of fruit that's been sampled from the vineyard. You have to physically touch each berry to uh, the business end of this spectrometer. And this is the control computer up here that uh, then takes the spectrum, stores it, and ultimately processes it. So this is just another shot of the same instrument. It is handheld. It's tethered back here through this tether to the uh, spectrometer, which is sitting back here. But it's something like that uh, field spec uh, pro that I showed you early. It's called portable, but you know it, it's fairly, fairly large and heavy. And uh, it also has some other uh, problems, and not the least of which is the fact that you have to physically touch each individual berry. So what we decided to do was looking into the visible and near inter infrared spectrum. We decided that we wanted to look at free air spectrometry. Free air basically means that the instrument that's taking the reading is now moved back away from the target so that there's air in between the sensor and the target. And that does two things for us. First, it frees us up from having to physically approach and touch every berry. And it also gives us a larger field of view because as we move farther back, the sensor head is seeing a larger and larger area. For a couple of years now, we've done some work. Uh, we've collaborated with JL Grew at uh, Stratus Vineyard. And in that particular vineyard, we were monitoring Cab Sauve, Cab Franc, and Syrah uh, in two different crop years, 2007, or 2008 and 2009. What we did was we used the inexpensive uh, USB universal serial bus spectrometer that we'd been using for our leaf reflectance measurements, only we started using it for fruit reflectance. So we're, again, we're in the visible and near infrared part of the spectrum. So with this instrument, essentially about 400 to 850 nanometer range. We followed the sort of normal sampling protocol, which is to say we would go out and we would collect 200 berry samples by going up and down uh, either side of a row and select fruit from different parts of the cluster, from the shoulders, top and bottom, trying to get as representative a sample as we could in this 200 berry sample. Then we brought the whole sample back in. Didn't have to bring it back in, but uh, we did have to go where there's some electricity. So we brought it back into the lab. And then what we did was we would scan the entire composite sample. So not just a berry at a time, but we'd take all 200 berries, scan them all at once. This made it somewhat more rapid, uh, a little bit more portable. Well, you can judge that for yourself. And it gave us a more representative sample because instead with one reading, we were getting a composite reflectance for our entire group of grapes, not just a single one. So this is what our apparatus looked like in the first year. So this is that little USB uh, spectrometer that I've been talking about. Um, it's not very big, about the size of, uh, I can't say a cigarette package anymore because nobody has such things. Um, well, as big as a small box of chocolates, I guess. Anyway, of course, you need the ubiquitous PC, in this case a tough book, to uh, control the thing. And then this is our very low-tech illumination platform. Basically what we have is a cluster of three quartz halogen lamps, low voltage lamps, which give us a pretty good spectrum as a matter of fact. And then coming out of the top of this thing, you can see this is the uh, fiber optic cable, and it's routed back here to the spectrometer, which is connected to the computer, and voila we can calculate, or capture rather, the reflectance of this bunch of grapes. Now, of course, 
these are table grapes because we actually did this in January and we didn't have any uh, wine grapes available to us. But the idea is we would have our 200 grape sample and put it in there. Well, the next year of our study, which was 2009, last year, we repeated the study, but we modified the uh, system that we used a little bit. The first thing was that we found that the effect of ambient light in the lab where we were working uh, was creating some problems. We were getting these little uh, spectral peaks from the fluorescent lights and that sort of thing. So uh, the first year of the study, uh, Wade Milton was a master student at Guelph. He did the uh, measurements. Uh, this time I've got uh, another grad student, Mike Fadock, is doing the work. And he modified Wade's apparatus. And basically, after a trip to Canadian Tire, he came back with a length of uh, ABS sewer pipe, uh, which is kind of nice to work with. It's got pre-manufactured caps that slide up pretty easily. So what he did was he modified it so that uh, he eliminated any of the ambient radiation. This is the business end of the thing. This is actually the top in the cap. And you can see those three uh, quartz halogen lamps. Again, the signal from above. In the center of that is where the fiber optic picks up the reflectance. And then in, out behind here, there's a length uh, of basically just tubing, which keeps the, uh, keeps the business end at a fixed height above the grapes. And then you put the grape sample inside the other end. The non-reflective container <clears throat> does a couple of things. It excludes ambient light. Uh, it prevents stray uh, reflectance inside this thing. But it also physically constrains the grape berries inside the apparatus. So that meant that Mike could reorient the berries by just picking it up and giving it a little shake. So rather than just taking one snapshot and getting the reflectance of one surface of that sample, he could shake it up, reorient the grapes, take another one, and, and take several. The idea is that these repeat measurements after this gentle shaking would give us more representative information because we're scanning more of the grapes. This is uh, basically the data treatment, the same data treatment that Brimrose and us and almost everybody else does. This comes from a software package called the Unscrambler from Camo Software. Essentially what it does is it takes some of these uh, large data sets and it uh, analyzes them. First up here in the left-hand corner, we have principal component analysis by plot. Uh, and this happens to be for bricks. So these are the data that we collected in 2008, plotted on uh, this PCA biplot. I included it because it showed an interesting thing. Two different clusters evolved. Here's one cluster up here. On examination, this is the Cabernets. This is the Cab Sauve and the Cab Franc berries. The strawberries show up as a separate cluster down here. So obviously, there's some um, obvious difference between uh, these two wine grape type. Down here at the bottom, this is the partial least squares regression. So essentially what we're doing is we take all of the samples into the lab, we analyze them in the lab, so we measure, um, well, well, we measure bricks using uh, the uh, optical, um, uh, optical measurement using a uh, refractometer. We measure pH with a pH meter. We do titratable acidity. We measure uh, total phenolics and anthocyanins, uh, uh, first using the full and Kolkachu method and uh, the pH shift. Basically, we do the chemistry to get the actual parameters that we're interested in in the berries. And then we compare that to the spectral reflectance. And this plot up here gives us the loadings of uh, the spectral reflectance in terms of the regression it shows down here. The interesting part is when we look at the reflectance characteristics versus the actual chemical determination of these characteristics, we get some pretty good uh, relationships. This on the left hand side, this is bricks or sugar. And this is, this is called leave one out analysis. Essentially what it does is it takes our calibration data, takes out one point, and then uses all the other data to estimate what that point should be. And we do that one at a time until we get this sort of uh, correlation relationship. 
So here's the measured bricks. Here's the predicted bricks using our leave one out analysis. And you can see we get pretty good correlation, pretty good 45 degree line there. So that tells us that we're fairly good at taking the reflectance and estimating uh, the bricks. Of course, there are easy ways to measure bricks as well using the optical refractometer. So this is exactly a big step forward. If we look over here at pH, similar sort of situation. This, this is also this Lee one out analysis. And this shows then the relationship between the measured and the predicted. It's not as tight as the brick, but it's pretty good. The main idea here is that we didn't really have to do anything except for the calibration process. We didn't have to do anything special to the berries. We just sampled them, took the reflectance, and then we could predict what the chemical composition was with a certain degree of accuracy. So it speeds the process up and it avoids the need to, uh, well, actually, avoids the need to even take the samples back to the lab. You can do all of this on a pickup truck if you've got the right instrumentation. Perhaps a more useful and interesting presentation of the data, though, is this, where I show the actual statistical breakdown. And I've got four different treatments here. We've got the 2008 Wade Milton study, where he had the Brimrose side by side with our UV Vis spectrometer. Uh, and then when Mike came along, he took the 2008 data and he massaged it a little bit. He used a technique called uh, the partial least squares regression with a genetic algorithm uh, envelope. Basically what it does is it tunes the uh, PLS regression for the best uh, predictability based on um, this genetic algorithm. And then we've got the 2009 PLSGA results as well. So if we look at the first uh, row along here, these are the uh, R-squared, the uh, regression coefficient for prediction of these different parameters. So the brim rows in 2008 on Wade's data was able to give us a 0.7 R-squared for degrees bricks. At the same time, our UV vis, uh, or sorry, vis NIR setup gave us a slightly higher R-squared value, 0.785. Not something necessarily to write home about, because normally we'd like to see these up around the 0.9 uh, or higher. But not too shabby. More importantly, this statistic here, which is the root mean squared error for prediction, gives us an indication of how well we can predict one of these parameters based on our reflectance measurement. So in 2008, we were within, just within one bricks unit. So that means that if uh, our data told us that it should be 20 bricks, it could have been 19, it could have been 21. When we look at the next year's data though, with, uh, sorry, the next year's data being 2009 here, we see now the R squared is crept up to 0.9. So it's a little bit more respectable. By uh, tweaking our apparatus a little bit, we were able to get somewhat better prediction of bricks. If we took the 2008 data, we were able to get it up uh, almost to 0.9 as well. And here you see now the standard uh, error of prediction has dropped uh, to just around 0.6. So not quite half the bricks yet, but we're getting there. If we look at the pH, R squared values, well, in 2008, using the uh, visit IR, um, not too bad, 0.88 or 8.55, and the error prediction, 0 0.06 on pH scale. If we take that along then to, uh, sorry, 2009, not quite as good, um, still fairly respectable, but about the same amount of error in terms of the prediction. So we can predict, predict uh, pH fairly reliably with uh, the spectral reflectance characteristics as well. Titratable lucidity, now we're getting into something that takes a little bit more uh, effort in the lab. 0.7 approximately in 19, or 2008, up to about 0.95 in 2009. So we're pretty good at getting uh, titratable lucidity, and we're getting it to within about 0.6 uh, grams per liter of tartaric acid. 
Phenolics, obviously important for uh, various aspects of red grape production. In 2008, about 0.48. So our prediction is not as good as we would like it to be. Um, even when we used the genetic algorithm envelope on a PLS, we weren't able to bunch it up, bump it up much better. Uh, the error prediction for uh, phenolics in terms of milligrams per liter of gallic acid equivalent, uh, around 35, regardless of what we did. Unfortunately, in 2008, we uh, had a problem with our analysis of the anthocyanins. We really wanted to, uh, to see how well this technique did for estimating anthocyanins in red grapes. Um, but uh, we had a problem with our laboratory analysis and we didn't get a consistent data set. Uh, I've indicated down here under the phenolics, and it's also true for the anthocyanins in 2009. Uh, Mike hasn't completed his lab analysis yet, so he hasn't been able to uh, fill this part of the chart in. Anyway, when we look at spectrometry and spectroscopy and the fruit reflectance applications, where are we sitting at? Well, we've got the Brimrose, which is uh, fairly well accepted. It's in use uh, in various parts of the world. Uh, we've got some new uh, pieces of information coming out and new uh, equipment on the market. One that I've just included here today is this new uh, Spectron instrument from Palenque. Um, <clears throat> it's actually based on research that was done at Montpellier at uh, Semigraph in southern France. And uh, <clears throat> I visited that, uh, that center a couple of years ago now, I guess, when they were in the development stage. But this has just recently come on the market, and, and you may have seen some uh, information and some data on this. But essentially, it is a much improved portable handheld spectrometer. Uh, what you see here is the entire thing, so it now is truly handheld. <laughs> It's, uh, I can't say very much about it because I don't know that much about its performance yet, but it works in a way very similar to what we've been doing with our pre-air uh, NIR work. In other words, what you do is you take it up close to the bunch, you shine a coherent light source on it, measure the reflectance, there's a GPS built into it, and it gives you um, some of these quality parameters. As I said, I haven't had any actual hands-on experience with it, uh, so I don't know how well this works yet. The other sort of recent development or something that's on the horizon is something that we're doing actually in conjunction with Lakeview Vineyard equipment here at Niagara on the Lake. Um, and what it is is the intention of integrating this visible near infrared free air spectrometer in with a harvest yield monitor. And the idea here is that we can have a complete system on a mechanical harvester where we can harvest the grapes, we can measure on the go what the uh, actual yield amount is, and with a GPS, then we can map the yield. And if we're able to perfect this VIS-NIR spectrometer, make it robust enough that we can integrate it into the harvester, then the idea is not only can we map the yield at harvest, but we can also map bricks, uh, maybe PHTA, maybe even phenolics and anthocyanins. So useful information in uh, precision viticulture. This, just to give you an, uh, an indication of uh, the yield monitor that we're working on, Albert Brooks is actually the student that uh, developed this and tested it. It's a fairly simple apparatus. We made it so that it can drop right into place, and this shows it in place on a Gregoire harvester. And the design is such that it can be dropped right in to the, uh, to the harvester without having to change the harvester. Uh, well, except we have to remove uh, one of the flaps, but that's an easy fix. What it does then is it intercepts the fruit as it comes off of the conveyor here, drops onto the weighing conveyor, gets weighed, and then drops off onto the lateral conveyor down below. So the idea is, and we, we tested this um, in, a, in a vineyard with uh, quite good results, that we can be able to monitor the actual weight of grapes that's being harvested on the go and we can map it. So if we can integrate somewhere up in here our UV vis spectrometer, then potentially we should be able to also measure not just the, uh, the yield, but also some of the quality characteristics. 
So looking at a future for spectral methods for rapid food quality. Well, currently, we're getting good results for BRICS, pH, and TA. There seems to be potential for rapid estimation of phenolics and anthocyanins. And when we, when we look at uh, the white grapes, some of the uh, volatile terpenes as well. So there's potential for developing uh, an instrument that is going to be quite useful. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. Some of the drawbacks to commercially available equipment, well, it's still, I mean, what can I say? Always the case, new technology tends to be expensive. Uh, there's the need to calibrate, um, certainly with the Brimrose, and I suspect with some of the other instruments, there will be a, a need, at least initially, to uh, come up with robust calibrations, which allow these instruments to be used uh, in a reliable manner. They may be time consuming, depending upon how they're set up. Certainly, if you have to go out in the vineyard and shoot, you know, 10,000 individual berries, that takes a lot of time and effort. But as I mentioned, there's new technology coming along all the time. New technology for uh, the spectral sensing aspect. We're getting new kinds of sensors, uh, faster, cheaper, better, typical kind of technology spiral that we're on. Uh, new information processing, which allows us to do more robust data acquisition and, uh, and uh, processing uh, in a faster and uh, more robust way. So it promises less expensive and more useful instruments in the future. So to get back to the original slide, have we unlocked any of these unseen mysteries of the vineyard? Whoop. Um, don't know. We've made some progress for sure. Um, we have been able to demonstrate adequately that, at least in extremes, we're able to make some useful uh, predictions in terms of specific uh, quality assessment, particularly on the fruit, we've made a lot of progress. There are other people obviously working on that as well. Um, in terms of the foliage aspect and how that fits into the uh, old precision viticulture, the jury's still out to a certain extent there. We have some useful information. We have some useful data, some good instruments. What we don't have yet uh, is sort of the, uh, the management scheme and the background that allows us to put it into a useful system. Anyway, that's what I have to say. And if you have any questions, please feel free. Actually, I have two questions from online participants. Oh, great. The first one is, can one correlate any spectral method to actual base leaf pre-dawn water potential? Okay, the question is, can we correlate leaf reflectance to pre-dawn base leaf Water potential. I believe that we can, but not with the instruments that we're using. Um, there are good correlations up in the mid infrared part of the uh, spectrum, uh, particularly in 1450, 1850 nanometers where the water drops tend to uh, occur. But uh, there hasn't been very much work in that area. And uh, I think. Instrumentally, it may be possible, but currently, uh, it hasn't been. Okay. Second question is uh, regarding the mobile unit you had earlier. What's the weight of the whole setup on that mobile unit, I guess? The question is, what is the weight of this mobile unit? And I guess, I'm not sure which mobile unit we're talking about. I can, I can speak reliably about the one that, that we use, which we made ourselves. And uh, it weighs about 20 pounds. I guess I should say that in kilograms. It's uh, 10 kilos, I guess. Uh, but that doesn't include the battery pack and, uh, and the hand pump. Uh, in terms of the, um, the Luminar 5030 from Grimmels, if we include the laptop, probably about 15 kilos. So yes, it is portable, but you wouldn't want to carry that in your hands all day long. Yes, Rick. The Palenk uh, spectrometer. Right. Uh, which uh, fruit composition um, variables has that been used to predict um, reliably? I don't actually know the answer to that. I, I know that uh, in the development leading up to it, 
they were looking at the same sort of things that we were, which is Briggs PHTA, phenolics, and ethicycles. And I assume since it uses similar technology, then it's probably quite reliable for Briggs PHTA, and maybe not quite so good for phenolics and ethicycles. But I haven't actually tested it, so I can't say with any authority. Yes. If you were to take off a leaf and bring it to the unit, would you lose some information along the way? Uh, it depends what you were trying to measure. Uh, if you were only looking for plant pigments and you were quick about it, you probably wouldn't lose very much. But if you were trying to find out information about water status, then you would have to be very quick not to, you know, not to affect what was happening. It could be done. I mean, when we when we do the uh, pressure bomb, what we try to do is, as quick as possible, take the leaf, get it into a ziplock, and rush it over to the instrument. Uh, but it would be better to do not that. I think. Great. Has any work been done on using leaf reflectance as an early predicting tool for disease pressure? Uh, yes. Yeah. So sorry. The question is, has there been work using leaf reflectance as an early indicator of disease pressure? And there have been a number of groups that have looked at that. Um, and typically, as, as I indicated, some of the work by Gregory and, and the earlier researchers found that there was a generalized response where we got an increased reflectance in, in the green, uh, green through the red. But it was not very specific to a disease, so it could tell you that something was going on, but it couldn't tell you exactly what was going on. Um, I know there are other people right now looking at uh, pottery building and downing building, and looking at other characteristics, not just the reflectance, but also uh, surface characteristics and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I haven't seen anything convincing yet that tells you that that's been successful. I have another question from an online participant. Yes. What about other portions of the spectrum, like uh, MIR, FIR? Australians have been doing some research uh, in there some years ago. Any news on that front? The question is what other parts of the spectrum have been used? Um, there certainly has been a lot of work done in the infrared, the longer wavelength part of the spectrum. Uh, in fact, some of the earliest work was done simply to determine uh, the constituents of grain and various other types of vegetable materials. So you can get protein and, and different things using near, near infrared, and also there's a technique called Fourier transport infrared spectroscopy, which is used. Um, there is also apparently some work going on in millimeter length uh, um, remote sensing and, and uh, proximal sensing. But I haven't seen very much in terms of what's coming out of those studies. Uh, there hasn't been a lot in um, in the high energy part of the spectrum, in the ultraviolet. But we're starting to look at that because we think that there's some information there, uh, particularly because we know that, for example, a lot of the pigments will absorb uh, down in the 280 nanometer, uh, which is getting uh, into the uh, ultraviolet. And it may be useful to, to try to get an indication of those directly. So uh, most people have been working in the visible and near infrared. Yes. Any other questions? Good. Um, I'd like to. You have to come over here. <laughs> I'd like to thank. <laughs> I'd like to thank Rob uh, for for coming with a wonderful talk.